smart to start with Rosa, I guess. But we do not really have that much time. Hello, everyone. We are really grateful for you for extending the invitation to participate. But here I would like to highlight that uh, as we are pressed for time, then I can cover certain topics which are of interest uh, to our participants. And I am hopeful that you will get a possibility to ask questions during my presentations or during Q&A session. And after that, if any of you are interested, you can can uh, get in contact with me using my email address. That would be the easiest way uh, to keep in touch with me. So we are talking about a two-year master's program that we offer at our institute. And I sent uh, some information to the organizers of the conference an hour ago, uh, a leaflet where you can find the information and we invite people, interpreters, those who are already working to join the second year of studies and to be able to uh, obtain a master's degree. It is also possible for you if you already have some experience, uh, you can take an exam and join us. We have a distant uh, mode of an exam, so you can be based anywhere and still take it. And here I would also like to talk about the practical moments as I know that very many of you are interested in uh, financial aspects and many people keep asking us why is it so expensive to, to study at your institute, why is the sum of money so big and you know many people they keep wondering to answer at least partially as a question. Here I would like to say that, as you probably know in the U.S., you need to pay for higher education, and it's everywhere like that. It's never free of charge, and prices, they vary. There is a website, uh, collegedata.com. You can enter the name of the educational institution in the United States, and right away, all the information will be available to you, any institution that you're interested in. And actually, it's not the most expensive at our institute. So the, the tuition fee is uh, $43,000. And for accommodation, we do not really have a campus like that for students. You really need to add some 15, 16 K to this uh, sum for dwelling expenses. Then when we talk about Middlebury Institute, you know that we are based in Monterey. And when we talk about this big Middlebury, it's in uh, Vermont, in the United States, the eastern part, and there, there are the prices is $56,000 to receive a bachelor's degree. The mastership program is uh, cheaper in general in the United States as compared to the uh, bachelor's degree. So we are not the most expensive or one of the most expensive uh, institutions in the US. Well, Middlebury, well, probably it's, it's, uh, it enters the top 20 uh, educational institutions, but there are also colleges where for one one year of studies, you would pay up to $70,000. Then again, in terms of financial aid, this is what it is actually called, financial aid. And I think that in your reality, it resembles a scholarship or a grant. When you enter and you apply for receiving financial aid, you do it directly through the institute. As a rule, the institute would give the person some 50% of the tuition fees. All the numbers can be different. And this is what you receive straight away. It means that it costs you 50% less. But of course, on condition that you take an entrance exam and that you succeed. 
to enter our institute, it's important for the person to have a bachelor's degree and also to have a certain uh, level, educational level, TOEFL, or there is this another British kind of exam. When you receive this financial aid, it's for you to decide what to do with the rest of the sum, how do you handle the remaining part. We do not really have very many people who come from families of oligarchs or millionaires. Well, there is something wrong with the sound because I can hear some echo and maybe it's only about me. Well. Actually, the sound is perfect. Well, okay, then I would just have to, to, to bury it. Everyone needs money. And there is this possibility also to work at the institute's at the institute's in campus for foreigners than for the US citizens, you know, they can work anywhere, they can have some side jobs working as. And of course, that uh, you are limited in terms of time because we have a very intense, intensive course, and one wouldn't want to be dog tired at the end of the day and not to be able to practice as much as they need. So apart from that, uh, and uh, this is how it works in the US, it is also possible to obtain a loan, which works perfectly well for the US citizens when it comes to foreigners, then you will need someone who comes from the US and the person will act as a guarantor, that will be the person who signs some document for receiving a loan and people feel absolutely fine uh, taking out loans because they know that uh, it will be possible for them to pay off these loans and it will take them some two, three, four years. A lot depends on what the graduate is going to do after the very graduation from the institute. You know that we have different decrees. Uh, here we can talk about different modes, translation, interpretation, and a combination of translation and interpretation. Then we also have degrees which is uh, localization and a site translation. Those who are ready to work in localization field, which is also another very specific uh, domain, and well, maybe for some interpreters they do not, they a little bit look down on it, they think that it has very little prestige, but you're wrong here. People who graduate from, who receive this degree, localization, I think that when they're in the second year of their studies, they already start uh, being engaged. We have uh, a career fair and we have very many employers interested. They physically come to the site and the representatives of the most influential companies of the Silicon Valley, Google, Apple, Facebook, you name it. They are very active in terms of participation and they hire, hire people who work with localization. And over the last couple of years, we had some Inter some interpreters who actually uh, opted for this, the compromise for themselves. So they were, for example, there were some people who were offered a job in Facebook uh, and they were conference interpreters. That was basically their field, but they knew a lot about um, different computer issues because, well, they, had, they were in contact with this issue. It is absolutely the feasible to learn the ropes about this field and the, well, the person joined Facebook uh, PR department and then we knew that when that person would be interested in some interpreting assignments for a couple of days then the person will take a paid leave and that was the compromise that they reached so that means that the person does not refuse from interpretation as such because well there is this compromise as a consciousness because the person took up another job but many companies they offer great high salaries to our graduates and in the US you know that whenever we talk about uh, pay uh, we talk about an annual pay not a monthly one so to start with when we talk about some companies 
So it's seventy seventy five thousand dollars and for a beginner for someone who just started climbing their career ladder i think that it is uh, quite a good sum of money and it's absolutely possible for people to uh, pay off their loans and so on and so forth those who decide to go into freelancing they are aware of the fact that it is working basically individually, autonomously, because that is not Facebook. Facebook is like a football team and people, they have a joint effort to accomplish something. But interpretation, and there is something wrong with the sound again. Well, everything is fine here, but, but I can hear that something is wrong. I can hear myself very loud. Is it possible to deal with that somehow technically? So I like to repeat here. Interpreting is like tennis. You work independently. We help you to receive the training, you can start working in different modes, simultaneous, uh, consecutive modes, you have all the necessary skills, you took an exam. But in terms of personal trades and other people who help you. Well, I think that Lena will tell you more about this, that we try really hard to help our students, but many things depend on students themselves, on that will actually determine that period of time which is needed for you to enter the market, and that will also uh, impact your salary and generally the money that you make. The majority of interpreters, those who do not join the international organizations, they choose freelancing for themselves. But we also know about some cases, and probably Yelena will agree with me, when other graduates, they also opened their own translation agencies, and they started working as translators or interpreters, and they also provided jobs to their colleagues. We know that uh, we are so-called mafia, and there are graduates from our institute around the globe. They all support each other. There is no competition. I mean, this aggressive kind of competition or hostility. Uh, well, people they they all respect each other. They do not take each other's uh, assignments. And over these two last years, we also talk a lot about uh, ethical aspects of the the profession. We do not have textbooks like that because all of our professors, uh, they work on those issues that they believe to be of importance for, for their students. They all take different approaches. It's very flexible. And in this respect, we do not resemble some other institutions uh, which uh, most of you who are listening to me right now are used to. So I've been talking for 15 minutes already, so maybe you already have some questions that you would like to ask. Thank you, Rosa. So or maybe you could channel the, direct, the, the conversation in a different direction. Well, are there any questions that you would like to ask now, or we can shift to Yelena? Are there any questions? Yes, there is a question, so please. Uh, good afternoon, Rosa. What about the very format of the exam uh, which you use at your institute? Are you talking about the entrance exam? Yes, I'm interested in both the entrance exam and final exams. When it comes to the entrance exams, then we have some very short assignments, online assignments that we give uh, to an applicant, a multiple choice test. And it works both ways, into English and into Russian, and again, from English and uh, from Russian, it's about uh, 
listening, reading, speaking. There is a subject matter which is given to the applicant, and then the person should talk for some two, three minutes on the subject matter. And then it, uh, it breaks automatically, basically, because well, there is a certain format of the exam. There is no interpretation as such. It's more about the fluency in the language and understanding. This is what matters to us. Of course, it is also about some analytical skills when it comes to multiple choice. It is explained there. Then, speaking about finals, at the end of the semester, we have an exam. Then at the end of the last, the first one, we also have another exam, which is similar in terms of the format, but there could be uh, several professors present in simultaneous interpretation. For each, um, uh, for each language, you would need to interpret for 20 minutes, and the same works for consecutive. So these are two passages for some four, uh, four minutes and a half. The, the topics which we um, work on with our students, we have a very broad spectrum of the topics that we discuss with our students, some technical, humanitarian, of the higher level, political, so our students, they're already absolutely prepared. And also translation, there is an exam in translation. Here I'm talking about uh, final exam, 600 words and 500 for uh, someone who is not a native speaker and it's 120 minutes. That's the time allocated to complete the assignment. I could say that among our visitors, we have one participant who already passed this exams, accepted, uh, uh, he was accepted, and, but uh, she decided not to go there. If you would like, I could just get you in touch, so, but I didn't. Uh, I need to clarify it. If there are no questions to Rose, I have some to Ross. Uh, hold on this part. Hi. <laughs> So, some technical issues regarding Zoom. I'm sorry, I think I'm out of Zoom. No, we could see you clearly, we could hear you clearly. Okay, and my presentation, could you see it? No but we will see it for sure. So, we could see your presentation on the whole screen right now. Thanks, that's great. Okay, I'm going to share with you information regarding studying at Monterey Institute from the perspective of the former students. So maybe I'll present you to an, another side of the coin in comparison with the teacher's side. And if you have any questions uh, during my speech, my presentation, I'm open for the dialogue, but I also I am ready to answer any of your questions if they are at the end of my presentation. So I'm from Rostov na Donu. I've studied at the National Rostov National University, and my first degree is a teacher of English and German languages and literature with presentation of um, translation and some practical skills of translation. And when I finished the uh, studying at this university, I started to think what I would like to do further. And actually, uh, in, uh, in Russia, first three years of study, I didn't understand at all what we are studying, what happens. There were some uh, unclear things for me in terms of disciplines. I didn't understand the purpose, the goals of those things, uh, lexical purposes of the language, st stylistics of the language. So the first three years, my university study, I didn't want at all to be uh, to be an interpreter, and 
um, and to be a translator. But since the third year of my studies, the interpreting courses, the interpreters, the inter interpreting discipline started, so I understood what I want to do further. And then at the website of uh, AIC, uh, there was a list of different colleges, institutes, and universities. Uh, so maybe this list still published there. I looked through this list, uh, I analyzed it, and I decided to choose the Monterey Institute because actually initially I thought that I would stay in the USA. Now we know that I'm not there, but anyway, I'm not sorry for any of my choices. In terms of funding, Rosa already shared with you information regarding different options that are present and available to the students. In my case, I received the scholarship. Uh, in particular, it was a scholarship uh, based on my academic results, or so merit scholarship, and it's paid not in cash, not on a monthly basis, but it was such a discount for my study uh, process. So, and I received 50% discount for my uh, studying. At that time, the amount was a little bit less. It, uh, so the amount uh, of fee per year was around thirty-two thousand of dollars per year. So a little bit less than now. So immediately from the very beginning, the sum that I uh, had to pay was half uh, time less than this initial thirty-two thousand of dollars per year. And uh, in my case, parents uh, also helped me. But I know that among uh, my peer students, my peer colleagues, not all had such an opportunity. Some people just uh, uh, took um, a loan, some used other opportunities, in, and uh, also in my group, to other um, fellow colleagues joined us on the, during the second year of our studies. And uh, what Rosa told about that is called advanced uh, studying program. So if you have some experience in interpreting sphere, you could also join the uh, Monterey Institute for the second year of its study. So I'm going to share with you about my own experience, where I studied, and what the outcomes of the study. So the first thing, when you just go there, go to Monterey, first of all, you see beautiful uh, passages, that it's beautiful of, of, uh, ocean. So I think that nature is incredible. For me, those uh, mountains, those trees, the, uh, those waves are so beautiful, and I miss them so much, even now, since 11 years have already passed. And I, I need to mention that I've actually graduated from the Monterey Institute in 2010. And part of uh, Monterey Institute, we have also the, and Monterey City, we have also small towns such as Pebble Beach and Carmen, uh, Carmel by the sea. And there we have beautiful landscape. You could go there, visit, and of course look around. Further, what about actually studying there? For me, when I got there from Russia, studying there in the USA, for me, it was strange, and uh, I liked it a lot that the whole process of study was uh, practice-oriented. So it means that each and every discipline uh, had its own purpose. It does. It, it means that uh, we uh, haven't received only information about the content of the language. No, we received information about the work of the interpreters, not only uh, with the laptop, not only during the consecutive interpretations, during simultaneous interpretations, but from different perspectives. For example, how to communicate with the clients, how to invoice the clients, what is the format or the template of invoice should be, uh, what is the pricing approach should be, because I don't know how now is the situation in, in Russia, but actually when I studied in the Russian Institute, I uh, haven't received this information uh, about pricing, how much we should take per hour or where should we should go after we graduate from the university, but in the Monterey Institute uh, it was fully and drastically another situation. Uh, we have been told about it. Not um, not only by 
just general people who know about it from some books or read it, but no, all the lecturers, all the professors in the Monterey Institute are um, practitioners, as those who practice uh, interpreting in their everyday life. So when you graduate from your studies, you know, uh, you have this general understanding about rates. What is a low rate? What is a high rate? And how you as a beginner could have and could, um, you know, it's from your client to your clients. And what rate is better for you in order to uh, just to gain the appropriate level in comparison with your peers, other former students of the Monterey Institute? On the given slides, uh, you could see some photos of from our, uh, from some of our classes. So uh, this class is called was called a practicum in interpretation. Uh, not only our students from the Russian group, but also other students from other language groups, we just uh, were enlisted into real events. It means that in our institute there were some lectures, some workshops, some events. The lecturers came to us and we interpreted all the things uh, on site in reality, not just in the classroom, but now uh, in the um, conference room. And for example, when I studied there, uh, my uh, my interpretation was uh, was strained at that time. Yeah, uh, it was quite a um, terrific experience. I was afraid of it, but it was great. Uh, also, we were sitting not along there because it's, because it was an opportunity to sit there with our uh, professors, and I think that that's really a great experience because one thing is when you listen some theoretical aspects of your profession to, the, to your lecturer, to your professor, and another thing when you sit in the booth together with your professor and you listen to it and he shows or she shows how to do it. From um, another side, so a part of our standard classes, because of course we had some lectures and classes uh, in the booths, in the classroom, and we have uh, some practically oriented classes, but also we had uh, some activities beyond the institute. On the given slide, uh, from the left side, you could see uh, a photo from our practical consecutive interpretation on the chocolate factory. So it means that the institute in the very beginning uh, communicates with some um, sales of the factory, uh, just um, arranges all organizational things, and then we have this uh, uh, practical uh, lesson, and also we had some uh, practical interpretation in the um, uh, in the uh, ocean ocean organization. Mm. And who you know what to do, you know how to do so. It's really it really looks like. Um, real on-site work. And there you have also your professors who helped you. Uh, a part of all these classes, a part of all these uh, lessons, there is such an opportunity like an internship. Uh, when I studied there, it was such an opportunity. I think that now it's also possible. For example, uh, when I studied there, it was a possibility to have internship at the Stanford Hospital and Stanford Clinics. So, and actually I was there. Uh, and see here, please, on this right side of my slide, that's the photo from the Stanford Hospital. Mm, here, that's the general photo of my group. Regarding my group, actually, I think that my peer colleagues are very, and my group was very interesting, it was me and one more uh, peer uh, colleague from Moscow, and in second year, two uh, more girls from St. Petersburg uh, joined us. A part of others, also there was a girl from Kazakhstan and 
and also one girl from Hong Kong. Others uh, at that time had already lived some time in the USA, so whether, uh, either they had a green card or some other types of um, residence permits. So all of you were native Russian speakers. Is it a requirement for this group or not? Could there be an American with Russian language uh, skills? Yeah, it could be. There, uh, we had one native English speaker, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, that he moved to, uh, he shifted to another studying program. And also here, uh, the girl in the blue, um, uh, in the blue shirt, so that's Katerina who, uh, who, who moved to the USA when she was six years old. Uh, actually, it's not. it was not a requirement to be a native Russian speaker. You could be an English, uh, English language speaker, native English language speaker, but of course, the Russian level, uh, the Russian language level should be quite a high uh, one. What is further regarding relations with my peer colleagues? I don't know how it was in other groups, but I think that I think it was quite similar, really. Relations are being formed, uh, as Rosa has said, with, uh, in such a format of um, Miss Murphy. So it looks like when we uh, meet each other, when we know, for example, somewhere across the globe, we know that we are former graduates uh, of the Monterey Institute. For us, it's like a sign, such a, uh, such an indicator that yes, if something I need, I could go to this person. Because if I need an interpreter, I would not search for uh, for some strangers. I would call to Xenia, for, for uh, whom um, I maybe don't know directly because she just um, graduated four years after me, but I know that she's from the Monterey Institute, so it works like this. And actually, going back to our group relations, I really, I mean, um, just uh, I remain in communication with my former uh, peer colleagues. Some some of them still are in the USA. Some moved to the Russian Federation. For example, me and uh, another Katrina, another my peer colleague, uh, we moved to Hong Kong. So actually, I moved there because I knew her, uh, and I. I actually, in Hong Kong, I had only one contact there, Ekaterina Mostova. And so I have been staying in Hong Kong for seven years. Uh, actually, thank you very much. I would like to move to the discussion. We don't have a lot of time. I'm sure that we have a lot of questions to Rosa, to Helen, so may I say something? Yes. So actually now uh, we have really a um, great change with, um, different, with the uh, students in our groups. For example, right now in our groups we have different uh, students from India from diplomatic families. Uh, for example, one of our uh, interpreters that, uh, who is the leader in the interpreting team of the Prime Minister of India, he's our former uh, student. For example, if you look at the photo also of meeting of Putin with some Indian uh, representative, you could see his, them here. And also, if you're interested in our uh, master program, all, we have a blog that is called Voice of Russian Thai. We have there a lot of photos uh, of our students, uh, photos of their work on the side, so you could uh, look how they work and what uh, actually uh, 
uh, these photos are. So are there any questions left? Everything is clear. Uh, no one wants, no one dares. Then, uh, thank you. It was very interesting. We will uh, just uh, for sure publish your leaflet. We will um, just circulate it among all those who wish. But also I have one more question. So if I understand correctly, right now you have online uh, online uh, studying? No. Our online has already finished. But if it's necessary, uh, we will use the hybrid format for our lectures and for our studying process. So that's great. It means that you would like uh, to stick to the hybrid format, uh, even despite of the, all the facts. You would like to, uh, because it's important. Yes, yes, it's important because uh, people should stay in the language um, atmosphere in the USA, in the uh, source of this language, how they could gain those necessary skills of interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Helen. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.